we've held a lot of go to conferences across the world and collaborated with some of the top creators and innovators within software. In this brand new go to book club, we give you key takeaways from the masters themselves in the form of interviews revolving around books they've created. Learn strategies and how to become a more efficient developer as we dive into the first online series of our go to book club. This episode was made possible thanks to Gotopia.tech. Welcome. This is the Go to Book Club. This book was written by Sasha Juric, one of our top rated speakers. We invited him to a conversation about Elixir in general and about his book. To lead the conversation, we invited Eric Schoen, Managing Director of Erlang Solutions in Sweden and an author himself. We started by asking Sasha. If you could do a quick overview, what is Elixir? So Elixir is a programming language. Uh, in theory, you could say that it's a general purpose programming language, but uh, in my personal view, it has like its uh, particular sweet spot of uh, what kind of programs can you write with, uh, with Elixir. And uh, such programs are what I call software systems. And by that, I mean uh, any kind of program that runs on the backend side of thing, any kind of a server, uh, server side program, such as a web server, but also, for example, say a database or a message queue. Uh, and uh, what is particular uh, for software systems compared to other types of programs is that once you put them into production, you know, you start them for the very first time in production, they have to be running for a long period of time, constantly, continuously for a long amount of time, like a couple of years or maybe even a couple of decades and during this period you don't really want them to go down because that essentially means that uh, the system is not providing any service at all. Another particular uh, property of a software system is that at any point in time it is doing a bunch of different things, a bunch of different activities are happening within the system like say all of us are making requests uh, to a web server and each request by a different person is its own separate activity. Uh, but beyond just uh, handling requests, the system has to do other things like say run background jobs or periodical jobs. Um, it might need to manage some kind of an in-memory state uh, such as cache for example. It might need to uh, do some uh, load control such as applying back pressure or, or rate limiting. So a lot of stuff is happening just beyond uh, plain request responding. And uh, what's interesting is that these activities are uh, mostly mutually either very loosely dependent or uh, in many cases even completely independent. Like say your request and my request are typically you know, completely unrelated. And what this means is that in a software system, uh, the, the, the semantics of success are not binary. You have like degrees of success, which is not true for every type of program. Like if you take say a compiler or, or typically any kind of a command line tool, you know, these programs get some input, they do some processing, they produce the output and they can either succeed or fail. There is nothing in between. Uh, but for software systems, you have this, uh, these degrees of uh, success. So like, of course, ideally, uh, we want uh, the system to always work for everyone, but clearly this is not possible uh, because, I mean, uh, ultimately we're humans and we're going to produce some bugs and some things will go wrong. And uh, even if we are able to write perfect software, this software runs on some hardware which will occasionally fail. Uh, typically, in many systems, we depend on external stuff not developed by us, like, say, external database or third-party services like, say, payment gateway, for example. Um, so these things might fall and it's completely out of, uh, or might fail, right? And that's completely out of our control. So things will go wrong. Uh, but because there is a non-binary idea of success, we, we can implement, we can capitalize on this and implement the system in a way that it uh, provides as much of the service as possible at any point in time, even when something go wrong, which is better than, you know, providing nothing. And so this is a very particular challenge for any kind of a software system. And this is what I, what I like to call, uh, what for me is high availability. It's not about, you know, chase, chasing some mythical amount of nines of uptime. It's about providing as much of the service as possible uh, for our users, you know, and, uh, also, of course, the system should be able to automatically detect when something goes wrong and recover automatically from that failure as soon as possible, given the circumstances. Um, so those are the challenges of software system. 
and uh, again they are, they are really applied to any kind of a software system regardless of the particular business domain or even scale even in smaller systems and simple systems uh, you still want your system to be mostly up and running and providing as much of the service now elixir uh, as a language gives us tools to uh, address those challenges uh, gives us you know like basic building blocks very simple in their nature but uh, very powerful and flexible to approach the challenge of high availability in a systematical uh, fashion um, now i want to say that elixir is not the only such language available uh, for this job uh, there are a couple of other languages like for example erlang or a lisp for erlang or gleam uh, as an example of a newer and a strongly typed language and what ties all these languages together is the fact that they share the same runtime, which is called Beam. And uh, this is the name of the Erlang virtual machine originally designed or written for uh, the Erlang programming language. And now, you know, with time, we have a bunch of uh, other newer languages built on top of uh, Beam. And Beam is really the secret sauce here, which uh, allows this story to happen, which allows us to build uh, highly available systems. Takeaway number one. The key ingredient of Alexia's support for high availability is Beam, the Erlang virtual machine. So, Sasha, speaking of the Beam here, I mean that's that's the Alexia virtual machine. How, how do you say? How would you say that compares to to other virtual machines that people may be more more familiar with, like the the Java virtual machine, the JVM, for instance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, what I personally find about Beam is that it really has a strong focus on uh, what it wants to do, and uh, this is to power the software systems, highly available, uh, long-running programs, which should ideally uh, never fail, never go down completely. And uh, Beam has been built from the ground up, from the day one, you know, even day minus one, if you will, before it didn't even exist. There was a lot of thought put into it, you know, how to build such uh, a runtime. And so build provides uh, many things at the runtime layer, which uh, other runtimes typically do not. Uh, let me briefly explain how, how, how it works on Beam, so it's going to be clearer. So uh, essentially the way it works is like when you build your program in a Beam language, such as Elixir or Erlang or uh, other languages, uh, you will start your program and a single operating system process is started. And this is the instance of Beam where uh, our program is running. If I run five Beam programs, I'm going to have five of those uh, instances, five OS processes. Now within a single uh, Beam instance, uh, we can start many uh, small lightweight independent programs, which we call processes. So just to clarify, process is not an OS process. OS process is one Beam instance, and then within a single Beam instance, you can have a bunch of these small processes. And when I say a bunch, I really mean like a large number, like hundreds of thousands, millions, up to I think around 100 million uh, processes per single Beam instance. Now, uh, these uh, these processes, these programs are completely isolated uh, from each other, uh, so they share no memory at all. Uh, they have their own separate memory space, uh, and they can only communicate through uh, sending themselves messages, which is also known as message passing concurrency. And uh, they are completely isolated from each other. So, like, if a single process crashes, if a, that single small program crashes, uh, all the other processes in the system are still up and running. Uh, so they will not fail and this crash can be detected and these are like the basic foundational uh, stuff that we get at the beam level now uh, what this means is uh, basically uh, I like to sometimes say that like we have uh, support for microservices at least some parts of microservices directly at the runtime layer and therefore directly at the language level we can uh, do stuff for, for which in other languages you have to fall back to the OS level and run a bunch of different OS processes and different components and uh, orchestrate them through some uh, service manager and whatnot you can do a lot of that stuff directly in a beam language such as elixir um, and so the idea of building a fault tolerant and highly available system is uh, like in its basic form it's like very simple to me uh, like let's say a system has to do this huge chunk huge amount of job you know everything the system has to do like it's like some huge big square uh, if you uh, take this big square and somehow strategically split it into a small number of independent or loosely dependent programs then suddenly no one is too big to fail Right, and so if you experience some sort of an error in a particular part of uh, the system, you know, like maybe there is some division by zero, square root of minus one, something unexpected happens, uh, still most of the system is up and running and we are still providing as much of the service as possible. 
And uh, at the same time, because failure uh, and in general, the process termination is not uh, a silent event. So any other process can be notified about it. You can uh, implement uh, self-healing uh, strategies. So like uh, one process crashes, the other one gets notified about it and starts a new process in its place or maybe redirects uh, uh, some jobs to another process that was uh, that is still available. Uh, so it's like a pretty simple uh, but very powerful idea. Um, Compared to other uh, virtual machines, well, I didn't do it like a thorough comparison, but uh, in general, as far as I know, no other runtime layer uh, has such support uh, uh, for high available systems or such focus. Uh, in particular, for example, in JVM, as far as I know, there is no lightweight concurrency at the runtime level. Uh, people do this on top of JVM, so the most notable example is Akka, which takes uh, a lot of ideas from uh, Erlang and, I mean, uh, brings also a lot of other interesting ideas to the table, but this is implemented at the library level. So like you implement Akka in a language, I don't know in which language is it written, probably Java. Uh, but uh, what this means is that you kind of fall short. Uh, uh, you basically can do only what your runtime can do. So uh, for example, in Beam, uh, these processes uh, are scheduled uh, preemptively, so to speak. So like when a single process runs in an infinite CPU bound loop, it's moved out and someone else uh, gets the slot. So uh, you can terminate a process even if it gets stuck completely, even if it refuses to stop. As far as I know, this, uh, these things are not possible in Akka or anything else because you essentially don't have the support from the runtime. Um, you know, the runtime doesn't know about uh, these lightweight, uh, lightweight concurrency entities. So. Um, in my view, Beam is really, you know, very focused and very well built. It's a really stable runtime, you know, has been around for uh, more than 20 years or so. Uh, and uh, I mean, Erlang itself is old, I think about 30 years or maybe even more if you take uh, the design uh, phase into account. So uh, very stable, proven practice in large systems and diverse systems such as WhatsApp, for example, uh, and of course in Ericsson telecom systems. Uh, so it's, uh, as far as I know, the best option we have available today or the most suitable option that we have available today as a foundation for building software systems or again, highly available fault tolerance and scalable programs. So yeah, I, I fully agree with you, Sasha. And this is really captured in, in the saying, write once, run forever, right? This, that's sort of the essence of what you just described, right? Takeaway number two. Beam is very stable, which has been proven in practice in very large systems, like WhatsApp. Yeah, and I'm thinking in the community now, there, there's a lot of talk about Golang and Darklang uh, and that are in some aspects similar. Um, what are your thoughts on, on sort of the differences and similarities uh, mm -hmm. between these languages and, and the languages on the Beam, Elixir being one of them, of course? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's uh, let's start with uh, Go. Um, so in my view, Go Go is a really great language for uh, building tools. You know, the complete opposite of software uh, systems, uh, because a tool, especially like if you want to distribute them massively to a large audience, uh, which runs you know a bunch of different uh, operating systems and whatnot. So Go Go really has a great deployment story, which I really like. You know, you build this uh, standalone binary and give it away and it works, you know. So this is uh, super great. I think as far as I know, it's probably the state of the art in that particular area. It's very simple language to pick up, you know. Uh, so uh, those are like pretty good things. But uh, I personally, and I know that people are building systems uh, with Go, but uh, personally, uh, I don't feel that Go is uh, as good of a fit uh, for that job as Beam languages. Uh, so, I mean, Go does have lightweight concurrency, but that's pretty much uh, all it has. Uh, so it's not just about having lightweight concurrency. It has to be designed in a particular way if you want to build software systems with it. In Go, for example, uh, all these Go routines are sharing memory, which uh, can lead to all sorts of uh, strange problems and bugs. Um, if a Go routine crashes, then the entire program crashes. So, you know, think about like a, uh, if you have a, a single Go program, which runs, I don't know, maybe a million of Go routines. You are, I don't know, handling WebSocket connections to some real time uh, game server or something like that. And a sing there is a single bug, you know, you have somewhere square root of minus one, single Go routine crashes, all of these connections go down. And this is like super disruptive uh, for all the users. You know, this is the kind of thing that will not happen in Beam when you design it properly. Uh, you know, you will just have one process crashing. Uh, 
Uh, then Go also basically has like still has cooperative uh, scheduling. Uh, they did a lot of improvements there, but uh, as far as I'm aware, they're still not uh, completely preemptive. So you can still end up with a Go routine which just, you know, uh, runs in some uh, longer CPU bound loop uh, and uh, just takes up a single scheduler and a couple of such routines basically block your entire system. And uh, also, uh, you cannot really terminate Go routines. This is a, a very interesting thing that you have on Beam. So in Beam, <clears throat> you know, because process is a runtime entity, uh, you can terminate it uh, by the runtime. You can ask the runtime, please stop this thing now. You know, and no matter what it does, it's going to be stopped now because, you know, this is the runtime level service. And so this is the first class cancellation at the runtime layer, you know, that that kind of things pretty much uh, are not possible to implement reliably or com completely reliably on uh, in Go or in, say, on top of JVM again, because the runtime doesn't uh, have the support for that. Uh, just maybe as a passing mention, you know, I explained this in more details through a demo driven presentation about a year ago when I was uh, talking at Go to Chicago, uh, giving a talk called the soul of Erlang and Elixir. So, you know, I'm giving a very high level overview here, but uh, if you want to see this in action, you may want to check out that talk. So yeah, in general, I think that Go for me uh, personally, I would definitely use it and recommend it to build tools, to build one of programs. Pretty works pretty great for that. Uh, probably the best in class for many such uh, scenarios. But for software system, uh, you know, uh, again, I understand that people are building large and uh, uh, interesting things with that. Uh, but personally, you know, for me, that would not be the choice. I feel that uh, Beam languages are a better, uh, better option. Now, when it comes to Dark, uh, this is a very interesting story. So I, I really like Dark. Um, I mean, what I've seen, you know, so I didn't really get to try it, but I just saw a couple of uh, presentations. Uh, I think that Dark really has a very important story. And this is a story that uh, Dark starts with the premise that backend development is very complex because you have to use a huge amount of different tooling and somehow glue it all together. This is like the modern state of art. You start with Kubernetes and then run a bunch of different components and uh, you split your system into a bunch of different microservices and whatnot. And the, the amount of technical complexity we introduce here uh, is crazy. This is like definitely server side, backend side programming is way too complex these days. Um, and so Dark aims to solve this by being uh, like a single tool. You know, you learn this one tool and you can do everything with Dark. Uh, so, uh, you know, it reduces a huge amount of this technical complexity. And I really like this story. Now, what's interesting is that you can uh, sort of get a similar story on top of Beam languages, uh, precisely because Beam already at the runtime level gives you a lot of the things that you get otherwise from the operating system. Uh, so like indeed, we sometimes say that uh, Erlang or Elixir is like an operating system for our code. Um, and uh, when you have operating system services in your code, then you don't have to fall back to the operating system level and you can do a lot of stuff from the language. And I've had a bunch of these examples in practice where uh, I built a system using exclusively Erlang or using exclusively Beam with nothing else running uh, on the side supporting it. Uh, so like no Nginx, for example, no external in-memory KV because we have like an in-memory key value storage called Ur Erlang Term Storage or ETS. Um, so uh, things like that, you know, uh, when with other languages, I would have to fall back and run a couple of different processes and a couple of different third party components and glue them. And again, this is a huge amount of technical complexity uh, with Erlang and Elixir. You can frequently, you know, get away just fine with a single project and a single OS process uh, running per each machine in the cluster. And uh, I believe that uh, basically with Beam, you can get similar, uh, similar uh, sort of properties that Dark aims to give you. Uh, however, uh, Beam uh, and the entire ecosystem is kind of a ground up story. It's more like a toolkit, uh, less than a framework. So uh, with Beam and standard libraries of Erlang and Elixir, you get like a relatively low level, uh, low level uh, abstractions. And then uh, libraries give you some medium level abstractions. And uh, what we are kind of lacking, and uh, Dark sort of starts from the opposite direction, are uh, like super high level abstractions so ideally, I mean, this is perfectly possible. We have good foundations in place. And again, in my view, you can typically implement something like that on top of Beam and not many other platforms. Uh, but we are lacking these high level abstractions and I would like to see the ecosystem evolving to the point where, like when I say I want to build a small to medium uh, distributed uh, web facing system and in 15 minutes, you know, I bring in a couple of libraries, a single project and bam, it just works. This is perfectly possible and uh, I would really li like to see our ecosystem getting there. 
Yeah, and I think that's that's a very good comment. I think the the ecosystem around the Elixir and the Beam is, is fantastic, and I'm sure there are brains as we speak thinking and working on, on exactly those things. Takeaway number three: Beam languages handle a lot of the complexity for you doing server side programming. You could say they're the operating system for your code. So, um, slightly related topic, I was listening to another episode on, on the GoToBook Club uh, on Elm in action. And, um, you know, Elm being a total different beast, of course, but what I found interesting there is the, the approach taken to, to static typing. It's very, very rigid. What are your thoughts on, on static typing for, for the Beam and Beam languages? Mm -hmm. So, uh, in my view, uh, the lack of static typing is uh, the biggest deficiency on uh, on Beam languages. Uh, and I mean, I know that there are like camps, uh, dynamic versus static. I personally, you know, done uh, bo both uh, for like many, many years. Uh, and uh, for the past 15 years, I've been mostly using dynamic languages. And I'm uh, now pretty much uh, certain to say that I believe that static uh, is definitely a better option. You know, I still love Erlang and Elixir, and these are like my first languages, uh, regardless of the lack of static typing, because they offer something that uh, I cannot find anywhere else. But I would love to see static typing story on uh, Beam languages. Unfortunately, uh, mostly it hasn't been available. So what we have for Erlang and Elixir is uh, what is called a success typing through the tool called Dialyzer, which I like to say is far from perfect, but it's the best we got. Uh, however, uh, there are very interesting initiatives. Uh, there is one language called Alpaca and another language called Gleam, um, which look very, very promising. Uh, and uh, they basically uh, aim to bring static typing into the Beam world, like, you know, proper uh, sound static typing. And uh, this is something I'm super excited about. I still didn't have the chance to try them out. But I would definitely love uh, love to see how this story unfolds. Um, yeah, I mean, the one challenge, you know, with Beam languages is because you, you really have two dimensions in the, those languages. So, like, there is a functional dimension. So Erlang is a functional language and Elixir is a functional language. Typically, all Beam languages are functional because uh, somehow the, the runtime itself is uh, tuned to that. And, uh, but then there is a whole other dimension, which is concurrent dimension. That's what I talked about, you know, the ability to run and manage a large number of programs within a single uh, OS process. And this is usually lacking from other languages. And like, like these two dimensions are completely, serve completely different purposes. Uh, and uh, the challenge is, uh, I'm curious to see how this will be solved in uh, like Gleam, for example, is how to get uh, a type safe uh, message passing, for example. Uh, so this is going to be very interesting to see how it unfolds. But in any case, I'm certain that uh, uh, strong typing can be added to Beam languages. And I'm uh, very, very excited about uh, Gleam and I'm, I'm looking forward to see how it unfolds. Yeah, I fully agree with you. I think that's a very interesting story. And the, there's even rumors that, you know, WhatsApp, they're being a big user of, of the Beam language called the Erlang. They, they are very much into strong typing and uh, they, they even invented different new versions of, of languages, uh, including strong typing. So let's see how that plays out. I'm, I'm really excited. Takeaway number four, the lack of static typing is the biggest deficiency on Beam languages, but it will likely be solved with the emergence of Gleam and Alpaca. GoTo gives you the chance to learn from the brightest minds in software development join community meetups and highly rated conferences, and take deep dives on your favorite topics with masterclasses. So um, moving a bit into to Elixir, um, what would you say are the, the key benefits from, from a business perspective? Let's say a, a business user considering Elixir, what, what would be the key benefits from that angle? Mm -hmm. So, uh, right. Uh, I mean, as I said, uh, Elixir, like any other Beam language for me, it should be strongly considered when you want to build a server-side system. And I don't want to repeat all that uh, again, but uh, definitely, you know, give it a try at least, give it an evaluation. Uh, but of course, it begs the question, you know, why would we choose, say, Elixir over Erlang, which is the first Beam language and uh, clearly like the whole runtime has been designed for Erlang. And I mean, there are, of course, other languages as well. So in my personal view, and just to be clear, you know, I'm not the member of the core team or I'm not the creator of the language or anything. So I'm just a user. I, I always like to say I'm a happy user of Erlang and Elixir. And uh, my personal impression is that uh, what Elixir brings to the table compared to Erlang 
is a better approachability and maybe a better developer productivity story. Uh, so uh, I have been using Gerlang in production for a couple of years before you know uh, Elixir even existed. And then uh, through the middle of the past decade, I was using both languages side by side. And uh, finally, a couple of uh, years ago, I, I moved completely to Elixir. And I like to think that I had like a good, uh, good you know, practice with both languages. And so I could have seen like pros and cons. And the thing is, you know, in my view, Erlang is a very simple language. You know, people get confused. People uh, think that Elixir is simpler, but that's not true. Erlang is a simpler language. It just looks strange to most people because it has this prologue-like uh, syntax, right? But uh, like very, very simple language. And that's that's really cool. Um, very simple syntax and very regular syntax. No, no ambiguities at all. Uh, but, you know, that's the problem with simplicity as well, because uh, the simpler the language, also the less expressive it is. So what I found in Erlang is that I had to write a lot of repeating uh, boilerplate and what you could call a no noise. You know, I know some people would say that it's like more explicit then, but uh, my personal sentiment is that it's more noisy. And so Elixir, I would say, which looks maybe more approachable for the syntax, which is the least interesting part. But, you know, it has like this Ruby-like syntax, which people, many people are used to. Uh, but what really, in my view, is Elixir versus Erlang is it's a more complex, more complicated language. Uh, so there is more, there are more things to learn. But because of that, uh, you as a programmer can also be more expressive. So you can actually reduce and uh, put aside some boilerplate. And so I, I found that it, like it strikes a better uh, balance for me personally. But you know, I wouldn't dare to say that either one of these two languages is better. It's more about you know your own personal preferences of uh, whether you like to you know, write a bit more uh, and then have that boilerplate, but also, you know, the simpler language or you prefer to have like more complex uh, features in the language, uh, but then, uh, you know, you, you also can reduce some noise. So it's a matter of personal preferences to me. Now, uh, another thing that Elixir brought to the table uh, back when it was, uh, when it originally appeared. So I believe that Jose Valim started writing it in 2011, if I remember correctly. I personally saw it in like early 2013 and at, at that time my impression my impression was that Elixir had a much better tooling support so like uh, basically Erlang didn't have official tool uh, at the time so you had to use some third-party tool which now has been integrated um, and which is now actually much better so the story in Erlang has approved as, as well um, but you know with Elixir you just get this thing and you start this mixed new project and you do everything with mix and uh, it was like very easy to build an OTP release even back at that time when uh, that thing do doing it with Erlang was a bit more uh, complex and again required some different tools. Even the community of Erlang didn't have this consensus about which tool you should use. So there were five or more different options to do that. So this is where I find, you know, historically Elixir uh, working better. I believe that, uh, you know, I don't really follow Erlang so much anymore, uh, but my impression is that Erlang has improved as well in those areas. And I kind of like the thing that, you know, having these multiple choices that these communities uh, essentially move each other forward together. So uh, we are all like whole beam ecosystem. And I mean, it's always worth saying that you can use uh, like in Elixir, you can use Erlang libraries and we wouldn't even exist if we didn't use those libraries, starting from the standard library and the OTP framework, but then also uh, third party libraries such as the popular cowboy web server and things like that. And also then again, uh, owing to the work on Elixir, there have been some pull requests done back to the uh, Erlang slash OTP. So essentially these two languages, you know, kind of work together and not just these two languages, but all of BIM languages as they should. So ultimately to me, you know, the uh, the question of say Erlang versus Elixir is all more about like do you prefer a simpler language with a bit more typing or do you want a more expressive language but also more complex language and again I think that uh, my impression is that Elixir has like a slightly better story in tooling in documentation maybe support for uh, tests and so on. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. And, and that, that was a bit of a weakness in, in the community. And I think that the, the whole Elixir team with, with Jose and the others have, have you know, moved the, the community forwards as a whole. And now the whole uh, Beam community can, can benefit from it. So I think that's just awesome work done there. Takeaway number five, Elixir is focused on being approachable and making developers productive. Speaking a bit about your book, uh, I think it's really cool and I love your, your t-shirt. So um, what kind of person did you have in mind when, when writing it? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Uh, thank you for giving me the chance to clarify that. Uh, so uh, Elixir in Action is uh, I personally advertise it as it's an introductional introductionary book to Elixir. Uh, but not for non-programmers. So it's not introduction to programming. I actually expect, expect a programmer who is, has some experience in other languages not related to Beam at all, uh, you know, such as Ruby, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, whatever, you know, Python, and so on, um, preferably on the server side of things, you know, for at least, I would say, a year or two. So uh, the reader should be familiar with what it feels like to write a web server, a web-facing system, the way I like to call it. Um, other than that, of course, they don't have to know anything about uh, about Beam or Erlang or Elixir at all. Yeah. Takeaway number six. The reader should be familiar with what's happening inside a web server. Nowadays, there, there are quite a, a few books on, on Elixir out there on the market. So what would you say is, is unique with, with Elixir in action? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I actually, you know, up until a few years ago, I read all of books written on Elixir. Uh, these days, you know, that there are like already so many that I, don't, I, I find it hard to catch up. Uh, my personal impression is, uh, obviously, no, I'm partial to my book, but that uh, my personal impression is that all of these books are great books and that mostly they complement each other. Uh, so in particular, uh, for Elixir in Action, uh, I wrote it with the focus, again, rem, uh, rem, remember I said there are like two dimensions of Elixir, so functional and concurrent. My focus was on the concurrent aspect of Elixir, because this is where I find uh, that any Beam language really shines the most. This is what, uh, what they bring significant to the table compared to anything else available uh, out there. Uh, I'm not saying that functional is somehow boring or anything, but uh, this is the, the stuff that I kind of treat it more as a nuisance. Uh, so. That's uh, one thing about Elixir in Action. You know, it starts very uneventfully, very like the first part of the book. Uh, uh, those are the first uh, f uh, four chapters. Uh, they basically uh, deal with functional programming and the type system. And uh, it's more like you have this and you have that and you have that. So you kind of have to survive through this first third. But then the, the second and the third third, uh, so the second part and the third part, they are uh, focused on concurrency how to think concurrently in Beam and uh, how to use it properly and uh, how to use uh, the higher level abstraction from the Beam standpoint or from the, those languages like OTP, uh, how to use those things properly. And what I really like about uh, those chapters is that uh, they, they are sort of modeled through my own experience, you know. Like when I was working with Erlang for, uh, I started uh, using Erlang in 2010, and back then there wasn't even the famous book Learn You Some Erlang and uh, there were a couple of books I learned from Joe's book, for example, but it wasn't completely clear to me how should I do things, you know, so I made many mistakes. And in a sense, this is replicated in a book, uh, so it doesn't, you know, just guide you in a straight line from point A to point B, but it does more of a, like a zigzag, you know, it, uh, uh, I do some things wrong deliberately. So like you start in a, well, one chapter and you're gonna start with something, learn some new techniques and build some implementation and you're gonna feel good about yourself. And then in the beginning of the next chapter, I'm gonna explain why this implementation is wrong, you know, and then we're gonna <laughs> learn something new and then we're gonna improve it, and then in the next chapter you're gonna learn that this is wrong too. Uh, so, but you, I never let you fall very far, you know, get go astray very far. But uh, I believe that uh, in this sense, uh, you know, my goal was to not explain not only uh, how you should do something, but also why you should do something, because this is what I found at the time, like in uh, in beam literature, you know, people will tell you like you should do it like this, and no explanation at all why, and so. Uh, I made some mistakes which I've seen on, the, I mean, on forums and other exchange sites that people also tend to make when, when they don't know this. And this is where I personally find uh, the book, uh, like for me at least, you know, uh, most helpful. And in essence, I wrote this book uh, the way I would want to have it, you know, if I, if I didn't write it. In. So something that uh, I was found, found missing myself. Now, I really love that approach. I mean, it's a fantastic way, way of teaching because that's the way you learn in reality, right? It's, it's never this straight path. It's always, you know, one step forward, a half step back and two step forward and so on and so forth. So, mm. so having that approach when, when writing a book is, is, is really awesome. Takeaway number seven. The book focuses on teaching not only how, but also why you should do something in concurrent lecture. 
thinking about you know being a, being a writer myself, um, I'm curious to what kind of feedback you you got on the book and what what kind of feedback was most surprising to you because I mean you said that you wrote it like you would have liked it right mm. so what kind of feedback and, and surprising feedback did you receive uh, so far? Yeah, well, I mean the book. Uh, so this is now the second edition. Uh, if I remember correctly, the first edition was released in 2015. So it's been like now uh, five years or so. Yeah, I got to say that I was uh, surprised. First and foremost, I was surprised that I got any feedback. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was uh, the, the first and the only book I ever wrote. And uh, I wasn't really famous or anything before that. Uh, so there were more fam famous authors writing on Elixir. And I really, you know, didn't expect that uh, anyone would even read the book except for myself and my uh, family. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was actually turned out uh, like a pretty, pretty nice surprise that people actually read it and I got a uh, very good feedback and it feels like uh, the book has uh, grown sort of organically, you know, so I see people uh, recommending it. Uh, and sometimes I get unsolicited feedback and you know, it's just someone, you know, uh, contacts me on uh, w whatever channel and say, you know, hey, I read your book and it's uh, it's a really good book. Thank you for writing it. And this for me is, uh, is like the best reward uh, that you can get from a book. You know, when you're not fishing for a review or anything, you know, someone approaches you and just says, you know, I read your book and it's uh, I really enjoyed it. It really helped me. Subscribe to the GoTo YouTube channel now for ad-free videos released almost daily and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming GoTo conference using the promo code BOOKCLUB. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more.